Hi, I'm Laurel Griffith, and I welcome you to Bible study. We'll be taking a look at 1 Samuel chapter 8. But before we begin, would you pray with me, please? Gracious Father, we're grateful that we can come together to study your word. We pray that you will speak to us as we open our minds and our hearts to you. We long to encounter you today. Transform us because we have been in your presence. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, before we read in 1 Samuel chapter 8, I would like to begin in Exodus chapter 19. So make sure you have your Bible today to follow along because we're going to look at several verses. Exodus chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. Now, the children of Israel have been delivered by God out of Egypt, and God has brought them to Mount Sinai, where he is establishing a covenant with them. He is going to give them the law, but first he is establishing this relationship out of his love and his grace. And he has delivered them from slavery, and now he is bringing them into a life of, uh, of living in relationship with him. He wants them to have the life um, of beauty, a life that is meant to be lived according to his principles. And so that is what the giving of the law is all about. But before he gives the law, he makes this statement about who the children of Israel are to him. It's a beautiful, uh, just a few verses of scripture. So it's chapter 19 of Exodus, verses four through six. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So God is calling the children of Israel a kingdom of priests, a treasured possession, a holy nation. He loves them and he longs to protect them and to provide for them and to keep them safe. And he wants them to find their security in him. And now let's look at Deuteronomy chapter seven. Chapter seven, and we're going to see verses six through 11. <clears throat> For you are a, whole, a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who were on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all the peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with the one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. You shall therefore be careful to do the commandment and the statutes and the rules that I command you today. And the rest of this chapter in Deuteronomy, God goes on and talks about his love, the depth of his love and his care and his provision for the children of Israel. So God has promised to uh, his allegiance to them. He has promised that he is going to, to keep them and protect them. And what he wants for them is to live according to his principles so that they become a light to the rest of the nations. He loves them and he is, he is um, bringing them closer to himself in the sense that they are learning to live the life that he longs to give them. They're learning to live by God's ethical standards. Uh, with his love, with his humility, with his care for the poor and the vulnerable. All of these standards are a part of the law that God gives to them. And he establishes this covenant with the children of Israel before they go into the land of Canaan. Now, these promises that God has made to them are finally fulfilled in the book of Joshua. When the children of Israel cross the Jordan River, and move into the promised land. And in the promised land, they uh, begin to, to uh, take the land and drive out the peoples that are living there. 
God wants to protect them. He wants the children of Israel to direct their attention to him, to only serve him, to only follow after him. And in Joshua chapter 24, we have this beautiful uh, call to commitment that Joshua gives the people. This is a familiar passage that you probably have uh, read, or you might even have this on a, a note card somewhere in your house. So Joshua says in chapter 24, verse 14, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then verse 16. The people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did these great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. So the, the people, the Israelites, made their commitment to God once again. They are renewing their commitment here, and they, have, they say, we are going to worship. We are going to follow the one true God. Well, as we move through this, the pages of Scripture into the book following Joshua, which is the book of Judges, we find that the Israelites have uh, betrayed the worship of the one true God. They have let their attention turn to idol worship. They have been influenced by the culture around them, and they have taken up the worship of false gods. So let me read just a few verses in Judges. Because now that they are in the land, they have forsaken God. That's We see this in Judges chapter 2, and I'll read you just a few verses, starting with verse 11. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. So the people of Israel abandoned the worship of the one true God, and they began to be influenced by the gods of the culture. They began to mix the worship of Baal and the Ashtaroth poles, uh, the altars of these uh, idols, in with their, their worship of the one true God. And the last verse in Judges sums it up. It's what was going on in that time. In Judges 21, verse 25, <clears throat> In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So this is exactly what was happening. The children of Israel were behaving the way they wanted. They were taking their cues from the world around them. Now, in the time of Judges, what God did was raise up leaders, raise up judges from among the Israelites. Now, Israelites were living in a decentralized form of government. They, it was a tribal system, and each uh, community or each tribe was responsible for their own economy, and they would they would uh, be responsible for their own government. And God would raise up judges to uh, lead the people and to encourage the people to follow the one true God. And what scripture tells us is that when these judges would arise, when God would bring these judges into, into the forefront, then Israel would respond and they would repent and would serve God. But when these judges would die, Israel would turn back and they would turn their attention back to the culture around them and begin to worship at the altar of Baal. They would begin to adopt the practices of the people that were around them instead of only serving God. So one of the judges that God has uh, raised up is the judge Samuel. We've been reading about his life in 1 Samuel. And so Samuel, um, when we looked at chapter 7 last week, what we read was that Samuel was judging the people. And, and what that means is that Samuel was bringing God's justice 
into the lives of the people. He was making decisions and leading people in their civic affairs in a way that was consistent with the principles of God. He was also establishing altars, which lets us know that Samuel was leading the people in the worship of the one true God. So Samuel has been someone who has served God with distinction, and there is no criticism of Samuel. No criticism is ever directed towards Samuel. He is truly a man of God, both a judge and a prophet. So now in chapter 8, we're going to see that there's a shift in Israel. There is a turn of attention, and it's going to set um, the stage for what is to come in the history of Israel. So let's take a look at chapter 8. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. So Samuel's sons might remind you of Eli's sons, except Eli's sons were being disobedient to God in the way ways of worship. They were perverting worship services. They were perverting the worship of the people. They were sexualizing the worship. So they their sin was uh, directed more towards the, the, the worship of God. What Samuel's sons seem to be doing is they are accepting bribes. So there is a perversion of justice with Samuel's sons. They are corrupting and one of the distinctives that the children of Israel have uh, have had is that God has called them to live lives that were free from bribery, free from taking advantage of other people, lives devoted to caring for the poor and not taking advantage of the poor. And so what Samuel's son seems to be leading the people to do is to fall away from following God's commands. Now, it's interesting to realize that the judgeship in Israel does not pass from lineage, does not pass from one father to son, does not pass through the generations. So the fact that Samuel has appointed his children um, to be these judges is probably indicates a, uh, a weakness on Samuel's part, but it is not something that God has ordained. And certainly these judges could be removed from their position. And then God would raise up judges to serve um, in, in their place. But yet the people use this, they see this as an opportune time to come to Samuel with a request. And so let's see what this request is. This is verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So the people come, the elders come, and tell Samuel that his sons are um, are not performing adequately. They are they are unethical, and they want the sons to be removed from office. But instead of raising up, asking God, turning their attention to the, the worship of the one true God, and asking God for help, they have uh, decided that they want a king. They come to Samuel and ask him for a king, to bring a king in to rule their country. So what they are asking for is no longer to be decentralized, but to come under the, under the reign of one king. And Samuel is distressed by this request. And he turns to God and God tells him, Samuel, don't take this personally. 
because even though it might feel personally to you that they are rejecting you as well as your sons, in fact, they are rejecting me. Because you see, the very thing that the king was to do for the people, God had done for the children of Israel all along. He had been faithful to protect them. He had been faithful to lead them. He had provided for them. He had been there so when they called out to him. He answered them. So God has been steadfast and full of love and grace and mercy, and he has been faithful. And so in this moment, when the people are turning their attention to the world around them and wanting what the other nations of the world already have, they are rejecting God, not Samuel, but God. And God wants Samuel to understand that, and he wants him, him to tell the people what they should expect when a king comes to rule them. And that's found in the next verses. Verse 10. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will always, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. Notice the repetition here of the word take. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to work. He will take the tenth of your flock and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. So you notice the repetition of the word take, that when a king is put in place, when the people choose their king, this king will default to take. He will take from the people. He will take their sons and daughters. He will take their finances. He will take their property. He will take from them their freedom. And essentially, what the Lord is telling the people through Samuel is they will end up in the same situation that their ancestors were in Egypt. They will be enslaved. But instead of being enslaved to an Egyptian pharaoh, they will be enslaved to their own king. And God is warning them about this decision. And now, if you and I had been a part of this group who were hearing from Samuel, God's message through Samuel, it might have given us a reason to stop and maybe to reconsider our response. And let's see what the people say. In verse 19, But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, No, there shall... But there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So here you see that what the people want is they want a king, but <clears throat> their desire for a king is not so much because of the lack of ethics of Samuel's sons. The true motive comes to light here in this verse. In verse 20, we also will be like all the nations. You see, that is what the Israelites want. They have looked at the world around them, and they have seen the way the nations of the world operate. And instead of trusting in the one true God, they want to put their trust in a human being that they can see. They want to trust in this person's military might. They probably want the guarantee that this uh, of the protection against the enemies, but also perhaps the protection of their own property and wealth. Because if these elders represent the wealthiest and, and the more influential, 
people in the community, then perhaps what they want is a centralized government that will protect their resources and their power base. We don't know for sure, but we do know that what they are saying is they do not want to depend any longer on the relationship that they have with God. Rather, they want to establish a king. They want a king that looks just like the rest of the nations. So instead now, instead of being a, a particular people who God has protected and shaped to be a light to the nations, what is going to happen is Israel is going to be just like everybody else. And the result of being just like everybody else is that this king is going to take from them. This king is going to use them and eventually it is going to be as if they are enslaved to the king. In these final verses, we see what Samuel says, verse 21. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. It seems that Samuel is so distressed he turns back to God in prayer and, and cries out to God. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. So God is willing to give the people what it is that they want. God is willing to give in to their demands. Now it's interesting to know when you look at this passage of scripture that back in Deuteronomy, <clears throat> before the children of Israel went into the promised land, God actually gave them instructions for what kind of king that they should choose, that what the standard that the king should obey when they had a king grew over them. So we're going to take a look at what God's standard is, and we're going to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 17. That's in those are verses 14 through 20. <clears throat> and here what we read is the way God intended for the monarchy to work. We'll begin with verse 14. Deuteronomy chapter 17, begin with verse 14. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to require many horses. Since the Lord God has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away nor shall he acquire for himself excess silver and gold. And then verse 18, And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priest, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statues and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandments, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. So God has given the Israelites instructions for the king, that the king is to be a person of great integrity. The king is to be a person who continues to focus on the one true God. The king is to be a person who does not profit off the people. And most significantly, the king is to be a person who saturates his thinking and his life with the word of God. He is supposed to dwell in the word of God and to, and to learn the word of God, to write it in his book and to review it on a daily basis so that he can be confident that the way he rules a nation of Israel is in accordance with the principles and the laws that God intends for them to follow. So you see, God is not opposed to Israel having a king. In fact, God has a great plan of redemption that's going to flow from the King David. But what God is saying is that when you put a ruler on the throne, this ruler should have his heart directed 
toward the one true God. This ruler should be obeying God's laws. This, his, this ruler should be someone who is in tune with the law of God, the care for the poor and the impoverished. This person should have the ethical standards. This person, person should be someone who has aligned themselves with the word of God and it's not profiting off of the people that he rules. Now, the children of Israel demand a king, and the reason they demand a king is because they have allowed themselves to be conformed to this world. They have allowed themselves to look to the left and the right, to see their neighbors, and to be attracted to the way their neighbors live. It's easier in some ways to be ruled by a king than it is to listen and follow the one true God. It's easier to look around and do the things that everyone else is doing than it is to live a life that is distinct and different. And isn't it that way for you and for me that we have a call on our lives, a call that God has made on our lives as we follow Jesus. But sometimes it's much easier to look at the world around us and to be distracted by what we see. We're not abandoning our, um, our discipleship. It's not that we are no longer following Jesus, but the world is so attractive that many times it's easy for us to bring just a little bit of the world into our worship, into our relationship, and we begin to lose the distinctiveness, what actually sets us apart. And I think a question we have to ask ourselves is, does the church look any different from the rest of the world around us? Or are we distinctive? Is it obvious that we live a different way? Is it obvious that we have aligned our lives with the laws of God, with the commands of God, and we have, we have um, made it our intent to follow Jesus so that we become to look more and more like the one we follow as we surrender ourselves to him. The Spirit works in us and transforms us as we focus our minds and our hearts on him. I'm reminded of the, the two verses that are so familiar to most of us, Romans 12, 1 and 2, and I thought I would close today by reading these, and perhaps these verses can also be a prayer for us. Romans 12, 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul writes here, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So in these verses, God is calling us to bring our whole selves and devote our whole attention to him, to not be conformed to what is going on in the world, to be, to focus our attention on Jesus and to have our mind renewed as we dwell on the Word of God, which is what we're doing today. We're focusing our attention on the Word of God. And so the Spirit of God then renews our thinking and we will not look like the world. We will not be conformed to the image of the world, but rather we will be transformed into the image of Christ. And one more thing in closing, you know, we serve a risen King. We serve King Jesus. And the beautiful thing about following King Jesus, as opposed to all the other kings of the world, is that King Jesus never takes. He just gives. He gives us his love. He gives us his grace. He has given his life on our behalf. And he invites us into relationship with him to follow him and to continue to live the life that he gave. He wants us to live the life that he intends, a life of love and grace, forgiveness, a life that has been reconciled because of his death on the cross. Will you pray with me, please? Gracious Father, we're so grateful for King Jesus. 
We're so grateful that you are our protector and our provider and that we can trust you, God. So we pray that we, um, you will help us, help us not to focus our attention on the world around us. Sometimes it's so easy to get distracted, to have our attention diverted. But Lord, remind us, bring us back so that we only look at you. Lord, we long to be conformed to your image so that we may know what your good and perfect will is. So we surrender ourselves to you today. Transform us, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you again. Have a great week. Bye-bye.